Um, but why don't we start with a softball like NSAIDs? Yeah. How do they work? You know, everybody's heard of Advil, yeah. you know, Aleve, Naproxen, all of these things. What they do is a couple things. They reduce some of the inflammation. They're anti-inflammatories. So I was alluding very briefly that there are substances that can be released out in the periphery during injury that wind up that, that nociceptor and amplify it. Prostaglandins, histamines, cytokines, interleukins, all of that, this inflammatory soup that occurs after every single surgery, every single injury that we experience, you get this inflammatory soup. And it's classically, classically mediated by swelling, redness, temperature increases. And aspirin and a COX-2 in, uh, COX inhibitor NSAIDs do a nice job in reducing that inflammation. Now, this, this is where medical science, I, 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 you're, you're going to probably be much more informed on me informed than I am on this, but medical science has been slowly shifting in its view of this. We have historically thought, take these medications in an acute injury, it knocks down that inflammation, and all is well and good. Well, some of the data was coming out in the orthopedic literature decades ago that people who were taking NSAIDs during total joint replacements were getting non-fusion of that joint to the bone. They were getting failures. Hmm. And then more recently, there's been some question as to whether knocking down the inflammation is a good thing after all, that maybe that inflammation is part of the healing process and that by giving an NSAID aspirin, we're delaying the natural healing effect and causing more problems. So where's the truth? This is tough. One, I don't think we have the whole story yet on the NSAIDs. Two, I'm a gray guy, meaning I don't live in black and white. And I'm also appreciated that every medical field has their own lens that they look at uh, in the world. And I think we have to appreciate the complexity of the patient, meaning if it's perhaps something minor and they can get by without the NSAID and it's not going to change significantly their level of function, then maybe not taking it will improve healing. They can't get out of bed. They can't go to work. But a naproxen helps them to do that thing so that they can engage with their family, with their friends, with work. Well, then heck yes, take the NSAID. You know, if it's, if it's helping with that level of functional improvement. And now, are you talking about this through the lens of acute, acute pain or only through the lens of chronic pain at this point? A little of both. But I think through uh, chronic pain, we start to introduce all the broader, the longer term negative consequences of this, you know, impact on blood pressure, your heart, impact on your kidneys with long term NSAIDs, particularly if you're older. Um, I remember, I think it was in your book. You took Vioxx. Yes. I loved Vioxx. I did too. And I still remember the day in, oh God, it must have been December 2001 when the FDA came down and said no more Vioxx. And I looked at my last bottle and I was like, oh God, no. I stockpiled it. I wish I did. I called up all the drug reps I knew because they couldn't like give it out. And I'm like, can you just hook me up? And so I ran out of stockpile of that for a long time. And, you know, this is another classic thing. If you, you can cut this if it's too tangential, but, you know, every field looks at the problem through their own lens. Here, you had a drug that was causing um, heart attacks. Well, I mean, in the world's most susceptible individuals at a relatively small, right, you, absolute rate. Yeah. At I've the, already at the had this dose. discussion with okay. Eric Topol, oh, which okay. was like mistake, net yeah. negative. Oh, is that right? Absolutely. Net negative. So, yeah, because I've always wondered- Merck's is faulted. Yeah. They should have been much more transparent about this. Yep. Put a black box label on it and we should all still have access Stop to Stop using the 50 milligrams, use the 25s and- you're right. Don't give it in susceptible people. And I think it's a class, again- Yeah, the, the baby got thrown out with the bathwater right. on that one. That's right. And it's a class, you know, it's a class, we all do this. We look at the world through our own particular field. It's like with a, the latest blood pressure guidelines, the cardiologists want it really low, but it screws up 
the kidneys. And well, the cardiologists say, you know, save the heart, screw the kidney. And uh, so, yeah, a great drug. Wish it was still around. Why do you think there hasn't been any drug that's come close to that? Like Celebrex is a joke. Like none of the, none of the, none of the drugs that are in the extra had a, a valdecoxib. I think it was a little bit close, but I think it. If I remember, it had a Stevens Johnson uh, mm. a bad rash with terrible consequences. I think the drug companies get scared of the lawsuits. Uh, oh, so so NSAIDs. Yep. Uh, nuance around taking. Uh, the the verdict do you, is do you up. have a, a version on on dose? I mean, do you say eight hundred milligrams of uh, acetyl of um, of ibuprofen TID three times a day? Twenty four hundred milligrams would be you would tolerate that for how many days if a person needed it? Yeah, uh, you know, a week to two weeks on that. Okay. Make sure you you're eating this. yeah <laughs> food in the stomach, fluids. If you're either older, you've got kidney issues, you've got GI issues. Talk to your doc first. You know, don't just go into this stuff blindly. Yeah, it is interesting that we can buy acetaminophen and ibuprofen over the counter, and yet they can cause a ton of damage if not taken correctly. I mean, the ERs see people with uh, acetaminophen, Tylenol overdoses, and you know, it's a cause of uh, well, you know, liver failure. Liver, yeah. liver failure. Now, um, let's talk about acetaminophen for a while. When I last tried to understand it, there was no clue as to how it worked. Do we, to this to this day, do we understand how it works? Minimally more information. And I haven't, in full disclosure, I haven't read up on it a, a lot. I know it has some cyclooxygenase. Um, one impact, a lot of it is thought to be central. Um, I haven't tracked it much beyond that. I saw some interesting, the side studies where it seems to have some impact in the brain around emotional uh, modulation. And so there's a degree of emotional blunting on acetaminophen. Now, whether it translates into a real world or if it's just an experimental manipulation, I don't know. But, but there's a nice synergy with acetaminophen and ibuprofen because different mechanisms of action, different organ systems are impacted. So you can take less of each when you combine them. What's your take on that? I think you just said it, Peter. I mean, you, you said it beautifully. I use those in combination to get the twofer, uh, to get that synergy. The one plus one is not two, but three. So you can take uh, Tylenol. Historically, we would say up to four grams a day. Yep. Um, more recently, there's been some push to try to reduce that to two grams a day. Uh, clearly, if you've got liver dysfunction, if you are drinking large amounts of alcohol, um, less. Yeah, my go-to stack if I am actually in pain, like if I'm having, a, like I, uh, a year ago I had, um, I had to get a crown replaced. Yeah. Or uh, sorry, I had to get a, a crown put on a tooth that had an old filling that broke. And it's the funniest thing um, because of how remarkable the teeth are at sensation, but the crown was a little too high. Okay. Okay. So what's the impact of that? That meant every time I took a bite, that one tooth was bearing the brunt of it. It was the last tooth I had. Uh, right in front of my wisdom tooth. And I'm talking to my dentist and he's like, yeah, Peter, it's just too high. Just come in and let me shave a little bit of it off. Well, I didn't have the time to go in. So for two months, I did not go in to get yeah. this thing shaved off. The pain was, un this is how stupid I am. Like I couldn't spare the two hours to go to the dentist in a, and he was willing to see me nights and weekends. <laughs> this is the most accommodating dentist in the world. Everybody should have that kind of dentist. Tony Pacheco. I can't say enough about him. And, um, and yet I couldn't make the time. So for two months, the pain got so bad that I eventually couldn't chew on that side at all. So my point is I had to be taking something to get through the day. And the stack that worked was uh, 400 of Advil, 500 of Tylenol, three times a day. Okay. Took care of me. Now let me ask you, does ibuprofen work better for you than naproxen? I don't know, but the reason I prefer it is that I can line up the dosing with the acetaminophen because I believe naproxen you only take once a day, right? Twice a day. Twice a day. Okay. But you're, you're right. Yeah. yeah. I wanted something where I could do it TID instead of BID. Sure. Yeah. The reason I ask is I find huge individual variability in responses to NSAIDs. Mm, okay. Naproxen works beautifully for me at 500 twice a day. Ibuprofen, not so good. At, at what dose? Uh, 800 three times a day. Wow. Yeah, with food. 
uh, and water. Are there types of pains people should be thinking of where these things work especially well and other areas where, yeah, that's just not going to have much efficacy? I don't find it as effective in neuropathic pain. It might take a little bit of the edge off. Um, nociceptive pain typically is your go-to. You're kind of your nociceptive or your nociceptive inflammatory pain, the kind of pain you'd see in a joint. Those are your typical go-to. Forms of back pain, particularly, mm -hmm. you know, in acute situations, but also somewhat in chronic. And, you know, I get a lot of patients that say, yeah, that didn't do it for me. But if you inquire and ask questions, you find maybe it knocked it off a little because in yeah. our game, we're trying to knock off pieces and pieces and pieces of their pain experience. The issues with the different responses are very individually based. And I think in part, it has to do with a little bit of what we call pharmacokinetics or where the drug is getting. And different NSAIDs can permeate different tissues at different rates. So you're saying it, maybe we should be empirical. In other words, try the naproxen, try the ibuprofen, figure out which one works. Obviously, don't take them together. Obviously, don't take them together, but your take-home message is spot on. Do you have a concern with people taking acetaminophen and consuming alcohol? Do you tell people to refrain from alcohol when they're taking Tylenol? I tell them no more than... I, I, I just said a conservator, listen, don't do more than like a drink a day. You know, is that the right amount? I don't know. But if I tell them one drink a day, they'll go do two. And uh, they're probably still okay with, uh, with that. And then I am looking in their chart just to make sure they're not drinking four or eight or, and there's liver issues. What do you do? I, I typically, when I'm taking acetaminophen, ref, I don't drink much anyway. I'm probably going to have four drinks in a week. Um, so um, meaning four days a week, I will have a drink yeah. or three days a week. Um, but if I am taking Tylenol, I'm just going to refrain. Um, again, I don't have any evidence to suggest that that's necessary, but it's probably the, the safest. The, it's the precautionary principle at its finest. Uh -huh.